the south and the east and west, all here. with hands raised high and our hearts quietly pondering, bringing our love, opening our minds, we draw near to God, near to each other, and near to Christ, the Word of God. Let us worship God. Hymn number 555. And our, our first hymn um, is now thank we all our God. And we're going to say we kind of cross it. Now thank we all our God. Christ using American 
in sign language. May the peace of Christ be with you. Amen. Our first uh, reading comes to us from wherever I go. The Acts of the Apostles. Oh, page 130. When Paul stood in front of his Areopagus, I can't say that word, what is that? Areopagus. Areopagus. <laughs> Something first of all the word. When Paul stood in at of the <laughs> when Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown is this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps broke for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as ever, even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring, since we are God's offspring, we ought to not, not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed of the heart of the art by the imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the word world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of all of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading is for everybody, thank goodness. <laughs> Please join me. Bless our God, O peoples, let the sound of God's praise be heard, who has established us among the living, and has not let our peace live. For you, O God, have tested us, you have tried us to the silver sky, you brought us into the net, you laid burdens on our backs, you let the
But, but we had someone in church who, as he aged, did not, um, did not daily bathe, was not entirely kept, um, just had difficulty, didn't have a personal need to, to, to look after, look after himself. And all of us would greet, greet our brother who would come to church. All of us would say good morning, we'd shake hands, we'd do the like. But not our Earl. Earl would go up to our gentleman who's now deceased, and he would just give him a big bear hug. Do y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's like on behalf of the congregation, Earl extended what we felt but what we couldn't convey. And Earl doesn't hug everybody. He doesn't hug everybody. But with a genuine affection, with a genuine affection, he wanted to make sure that this man who came to church almost every Sunday knew that we loved him. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to get the message that Earl got when Jesus says, love one another.
And on that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. They who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me. And those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. Friends, this also is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thirty years ago, a high school teacher in Alliance, Nebraska, came up with a special project for his class. Tim Waltz uh, was teaching his students about genocide. And so, of course, they talked about the killing of the Jews by the Germans, the slaughter of the Armenians by the Turks, and the mass murders of the Cambodians by the Cameroons. Beyond learning about the history of these events, he wanted his students to understand what the conditions were that made possible these heinous <clears throat> genocides. And so he described how he came about developing a particular class project. Tim Waltz said, the Holocaust is taught too often purely as a historical event, an anomaly, a moment in time. Students understood what had happened and that it was terrible and that people who did this were monsters. The problem is that relieves us of responsibility. Obviously, the mastermind was sociopathic, but on the scale for it to happen, there had to be a lot of people in the country who chose to go down that path. And you have to make the intellectual leap to figure out the reasons why. And so Waltz's freshman class at Alliance High School spent nine weeks trying to figure out why genocides happen. Ninth graders, ninth graders, about a little bit older than Patrick and Maggie, who are here today. This was before the internet, 30 years ago, before common use of the internet. The students had to use books and academic journals for their research. They analyzed information about the economic conditions, the ethnic composition, and the natural resources of the nations where genocide had been perpetrated. And they explored the broader concept of colonialism, civil war, and totalitarian ideology. For a final preacher, for a final preacher, for a final project, for a final project, the teacher asked his students to use what they had learned about previous genocides to consider where a future genocide might happen. And to help them along, he gave them a list of a dozen countries. They had to work together to predict which nation was at greatest risk for having a genocide. And the class launched into their final study. They looked at each of the nations on the list, former Soviet republics, Yugoslavia, and some African countries. And then they gathered data on the economic conditions, the ethnic composition, and the natural resources of those countries. And finally, they considered the forms of governments in those lands. And the year was 1993. These were high school freshmen in Nebraska analyzing which country was at greatest risk for genocide. And their conclusion? Rwanda. Evidence for their findings was ample. The Hutus and the Tutsis had ethnic rivalries. The Belgian colonists, the colonialists had been partial toward the Tutsis. Already there had been violence among the tribes. And the freshmen in Nebraska could see beforehand what we did not witness until afterwards. The beginning in April of 1994, Tutsis and moderate Hutus were slaughtered by militant Hutus. The length of time needed to kill 800,000 people. 800,000 people. Three months. 
Lene Merwin is now 46 years old, and she remembers the spring of 1994. She was in that class, and she said it was terribly chilly. But to us, it wasn't totally surprising. We discussed it in class, and it was happening. Though you don't want a prediction like that to come true, it did. Jesus never lived in Alliance, Nebraska. He never traveled to the land we now call Rwanda. But he had covered enough territory in Palestine to understand the vulnerability of humans. A vulnerability that exists simply because we live together in community. We share spaces. We share natural resources. Yet we have differences, ethnic, economic, ideological, and harmony between disparate people is maintained by a delicate balance. And to keep that balance, there is a need for love. Jesus knew that people who love one another hesitate to harm each other. People who love each other attempt to remain bound by their love. People who love each other are loath to injure. People who love one another will behave differently than those who do not. That is why during his farewell discourse, Jesus said to his followers, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. 